uh, workshop of the uh, Western Governors Workforce Development Initiative. You know, I think you always expect a little bit of a attrition in day two of a two-day uh, convocation like this, especially after you've been off campus for a great breakfast. But, uh, um, you know, I look around the room and, and you are the true warriors. You're the ones that I want to go to battle with. So thanks for, uh, for uh, returning for uh, the conclusion of our initiative. And, and we've had a couple of important sessions this morning, um, starting with a conversation about filling the uh, post-secondary cr credential gap. And to lead this discussion, I'd like to introduce Perry England, who is the Vice President of Building Performance at McDonald Miller Facility Solutions. And this is really a, a pioneering company that is transforming the energy services industry and making a significant impact on minimizing the uh, uh, impacts of commercial buildings on the environment. Uh, Perry is also the chair of the Washington Workforce Board uh, and a very, very big deal. So, uh, Perry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Wow, I, I want to steal that for your introduction about McDonald Motors, so I appreciate that. Um, so I just thought I'd start here, and then I was told to move over to uh, the table for, for additional conversation so that we get captured on the, the live screen. So apologize for those out there that are watching online. I'll, I'll get back in your frame here shortly. Um, just to set the stage here, uh, we've got a great group of panelists, but I also see folks out there in the audience, too, that, that I recognize that are deeply engaged in solving what we define as a skills gap issue. Um, as you know, we have, uh, from the Washington Roundtable, we have uh, 740,000 jobs over the next five years that we got to find talent for. And that's a pretty daunting task. And, and you know, right now, I think we're hovering around 4.5% unemployment. And that unemployment number is just for those that are actively engaged in our workforce system, right, that are actually looking for work. And, and it doesn't include all those that have been are absent, dislocated, and, and not disengaged, I guess is the right term, uh, disengaged in our system, which, which probably makes that number significantly higher by a couple of more percentage points, at least. I didn't look at the data prior to this, but I know it exists. Um, so so we, we have a talent pool out there. Those that we know are there, those that are currently working in our organizations, and those that have been totally disengaged in, in finding employment for various reasons. Um, so that's in kind of the adult population category to a large extent. Those that may or may not have a college or high school education or have some continuing edu post-secondary education. But then you also complicate our, our not complicate, but you can actually look at the other offside of the opportunity, which I'm deeply engaged in and apologize for kind of blending the two together. But it's also the Career Connect learning, right? We have kids in our public education system that aren't necessarily desiring our program to go to post-secondary education, and they really have a, a personal need or a personal desire to, to get gainful employment while in high school and, and be able to connect their learning in high school um, in the in K-12 system with their diploma. Right? So, um, and, and so it creates another um, pool of talent that I feel in the state of Washington, and I know you all are coming from um, other states and on the West Coast, but at least in our state, it, it, it presents unique opportunities for us that we're trying to solve as a workforce development system. Um, so with that kind of as a general context, um, I know this session until about 10.45 is intended to really focus on that adult learner. Um, and, and we've got a esteemed group of panelists here that have a way further depth of experience and um, uh, success uh, than I do as, as focusing on the adult learner and what the different organizations are doing to um, address that, that, that opportunity. Um, to start, what I thought I'd do is to set the ground rules of your engagement with us um, is to um, make sure that you understand that once we get through these introductions, it's going to be your opportunity to engage with our panel. Hmm. All right, so we're not going to wait to the end to take 15 minutes of questions. We are going to do questions throughout this entire 45 minutes to an hour that we have together. Um, is that fair? You all ready for it? You got that breakfast burning in your belly, you need to burn some energy? <laughs> All right, that's good, because we're going we're gonna to do it here, we're going to do a sprint. Um, I've asked the 
the panels to prepare you know, their professional backgrounds and experiences, so you have context of where they're coming from, um, as well as their business, what their entity, whether it be a, a non-governmental organization, NGO, uh, focused on education, or an employer um, like one at Amazon and what they're doing uh, at Amazon to address what they define as the, the uh, opportunity. Um, so what, with that, um, with that context set, I've asked them to expand the professional and business uh, perspective into how they're defining the skills gap issue from their perspective and what their respective organization is doing to uh, solve that opportunity or to solve that problem that they've defined. So with that, we're going to start, I think we're going in this order, right, with Christina first. So Christina? Awesome. Thank you so much. Well. Um, uh, I will try to live up to that introduction. Um, so my name is Christina Brown. I'm the Director of External Relations with the Lieutenant Governor's Office, and I manage the Lieutenant Governor's Higher Education Portfolio. Um, and so just because uh, what you're working on here with uh, workforce development and re-engaging adults is so, is so directly relevant to the initiative, uh, or one of the initiatives that the Lieutenant Governor is working on uh, in our office in higher education, uh, called the Complete Washington Initiative, which is an adult re-engagement higher education program that comes at the issue from both a uh, workforce perspective and socioeconomic uh, mobility perspective. Um, and usually when I introduce this program, uh, I come at it, I, I try to give a little bit of statistical context, um, but I know that I'm surrounded by um, a bunch of the experts from whom I got those statistics, <laughs> namely the Washington Student Achievement Council and the Workforce Board. So um, I thought I'd go light on that, give you guys a little bit of a sense of where our office comes uh, to, into this work at all, how we fit into the state, um, and sort of what the initiative looks like and what we're hoping um, from our office uh, for the future of, of the Complete Washington Initiative. Um, so the reason that our office has uh, become involved with this is the Lieutenant Governor has uh, made Expanding access to the college pipeline, one of the three main pillars of his office. Um, the other two being uh, economic development and international relations and uh, veterans and disabilities employment. And so we, you know, in our office there are a couple different ways that you can go about um, expanding the college pipeline. Um, and the reason that we, in this initiative, have focused on adults, there are a couple of reasons. One. Um, you know, there, there are, there's been so much work done um, on different parts of the pipeline, you know, encouraging underserved youth in high schools uh, to make sure that they're getting into the college pipeline, um, helping uh, rural communities, and, um, you know, the, there, there are um, wonderful uh, programs right now in Washington to help adults, um, but we thought that this was the place where we could make the most impact. Um, and also, we wanted to make sure that our office was doing this in a coordinated way with other organizations in the state. And so we've been working to develop this initiative with the Washington Student Achievement Council, who has identified um, adults uh, as, as a priority population for both um, you know, meeting these workforce needs and also for um, improving the economic health of Washington State, which you know, in some ways is the same thing. Um, and so uh, the, the other two reasons that we, we decided to focus on this is because um, this, the adult population is both, they both have a strong need in the state themselves um, to access higher education and therefore um, to have access to better jobs, um, and also uh, the, the need in our state from the employer side is, is pretty stark. Um, and we found that to be statistically true and anecdotally true in our office. Um, so I'll just share with you a couple of statistics that I think that many of you are aware of. Um, but 97% of the good jobs that have been created since the Great Recession have gone to uh, bachelor's degrees holders. Um, we know that uh, having a bachelor's degree or having a post-secondary credential significantly increases your economic resilience. Um, you know, if there's uh, a loss of job, you are much more likely to have an opportunity uh, to, to get one after that. Um, and, and in Washington State, the uh, workforce needs are pretty stark. Um, you know, we are rated as one of the highest, uh, most highly educated states in the U.S., but that's not because, um, 
you know, we have this beautiful equitable map of higher education in our state, it's because we import lots of um, highly talented, highly educated workers um, to meet our workforce needs. Um, and so right now in Washington State, as so many of you know, there's a huge uh, gap between the sorry between the supply of bachelor's degrees um, and the demand of workforce, particularly in healthcare and computer science. Um, the last uh, piece of data that I read on this was that um, in Washington State, um, the supply demand gap between uh, computer science uh, or in the computer science industry um, is 146 percent is the, the gap between. Uh, credential workers that we're producing um, and the demand from the workforce side. So that's the that's the data that um, you know hits us. On the other side of it, anecdotally, it's been it's been so clear as well. You know, um, the lieutenant governor, as part of his economic development work, um, we've been uh, going on these statewide tours of uh, statewide economic development tours. We've uh, traveled to probably. Uh, I think we're at 14 different counties, uh, mostly rural, to meet with constituents um, and to meet with business leaders to talk about workforce needs, um, find opportunities for job growth. And these stories are the ones that we see constantly. You know, it's the worker who is a fourth generation uh, logger who has had a good job until he was injured and now all of a sudden, um, you know, is on a workers' comp. Or it's the, the fishing town in Grace Harbor, where uh, you know people have a huge um, barrier to education because um, you know the main road floods every couple of weeks, um, and they have broadband, so they have access to online ed education, but they don't uh, they don't have any way to get to Grace Harbor College, that kind of thing. So, so that's how we. That's you know sort of hopefully not too long a version of how we got here and why we decided to put together this Complete Washington Initiative. Um, and so, so the goal of the Complete Washington Initiative, Complete Washington Initiative um, working off of the Washington Student Achievement Council's um, priorities, um, because like I said, we want to be as coordinated as possible, is to uh, conduct outreach um, and to deliver uh, to, to reduce some of the barriers to education for some of the 300,000 adults in Washington State who have one year of college but no degree. Um, and so uh, right now we are in the development stage of this initiative and we are uh, putting it together in coordination or in collaboration <coughs> with uh, the Lumina Foundation um, and we are uh, developing partnerships across the state. I've been really encouraged by um, how ready so many in Washington are to, to work on this same issue. Um, and one of our first partners, of course, has been Western Governors University, um, because uh, we see the online delivery model as you know, essential to reaching these adults um, who may have, uh, you know, they're place bound, um, may have cost issues, may have uh, careers that make it difficult to go to a physical location to, um, to get their higher education. And so as we put this together, um, you know, our, our primary purpose is to um, uh, launch a, a pilot program uh, starting next year that um, includes an online delivery model, um, partners with additional institutions of higher education as well as employers to get at both the socioeconomic side of this for individuals and then also the workforce needs um, in Washington State. So. Rich, thank you very much. Um, do I have to push the staff? Yeah, I think I have to push the staff. Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Mary um, and Christina. So uh, I prepared some points uh, to uh, describe in some manner uh, briefly how the GU Washington, the Western Governors University, works. But before I do that, I want to address your larger issue of the skills gap, and um, and then hopefully that will show how uh, WGU fits into that um, kind of discussion. So um, I think that higher education fundamentally in a knowledge economy is about um, social mobility. I think it's fundamental to American democracy in the 21st century. I think that, um, that as the economy has required a skilling up of the American labor force, access to higher education is absolutely critical to, uh, to our futures. Um, when I think about my father, I think of a guy who graduated uh, from the U.S. Navy in 1946. 
he was a corpsman um, on the USS Intrepid, saw every major battle in the South Pacific. Um, when he went stateside, uh, there was no uh, competency-based program, no university that could give him basically the credential to get started on an RN degree because he had the equivalent of an LPN experience. He had seen everything you could ever see medically on that ship during battle. Um, so, you know, when, uh, when we talk about um, that generation, we have uh, World War II vets who came back and built a manufacturing economy. My dad got a job as a salesman, which resided on the backbone of the American manufacturing economy. And he learned a set of skills in the first six months or so as a salesman, which he repeated for 35 years until he received a pension. Um, that world's gone. Uh, the world now requires higher education or some kind of further education in many regards. So uh, if, if, uh, if it's about social mobility, then um, you know the statistics that you all know are just uh, so amazingly jaw-dropping. Uh, if I look at the, the, uh, the report that came out of Georgetown University last summer, um, I, it just kind of blows me away. There were 11 and a half million jobs created in the American economy since the Great Recession. Only 80,000 of those jobs are occupied by individuals with a high school diploma or less. I mean, that is just absolutely stunning. Uh, if, uh, if those 80,000 um, uh, actually have jobs, uh, other data that you can take a look at show that uh, for individuals who have a bachelor's degree or more, the Great Recession never happened. Uh, for individuals with a high school diploma or less, it's never ended. So I mean, there's really something going on here in terms of skills gaps and trying to get people to the education they need to perform in the workforce and to get the jobs that they need. So, um, you know, the WGU was founded in 1997, started 20 years ago, uh, at the request of uh, 19 uh, city governors at the time. And um, right now in, a, in America, I think this is 2012 data actually, 14% uh, of all undergraduate enrollments in America are first, are 18 year old to 22 year old residential full time students. The other 86% are others, <laughs> right? The non trad has become the traditional. Um, so, WGU in, 19, in the mid 1990s, these governors were sitting around at their WGA convention in Salt Lake, Park City and uh, we're trying to figure out how to address this huge looming skills gap in the American economy. And one of the things that uh, Roy Romer, who was the Democrat uh, governor of Colorado, said was, look, I, I own a crop dusting business. If I could, uh, if I got hire pilots, I don't, I don't care where they got their credential as a pilot. I don't care how much time they spent getting their credential as a pilot. I only care if they can get the plane off the runway, avoid power lines, and land the plane. Um, that's all I really care about. Is there a way that we could build a university with that same kind of model? And uh, WGU then focused on competency-based education. And competency-based education is education that focuses on learning as the variable, not time. So in traditional education, and this is a problem for some working adults, traditional education is wonderful as it is. It is. Um, and I'm not at all uh, disclaiming uh, traditional face-to-face -face brick and mortar institutions, which are wonderful. Um, in that kind of environment, um, time is the most significant variable. You sit in a quarter or a semester for a period of time. At the end, the learning is variable, and you get an A through an F, um, and uh, you move on to the next course if you don't, that kind of thing. In competency-based learning, um, the student is able to move at his or her own speed because learning is the constant. Technology enables the ability to move more rapidly or more slowly as is needed. Semesters are six months long rather than 10 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. And um, as the student uh, progresses, he or she is required to demonstrate a B or more mastery of the subject. No one can get through with a C or a D or an F, right? So, um, confidence in the discipline at hand is obtained through rigorous assessment. Um, there, there are all kinds of uh, ways that information technology allow for rigorous assessment at a distance. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't the case maybe 30 years ago where a student could have someone else write his or her papers. Um, that doesn't happen any longer with, uh, with good IT. Um, um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is, is these uh, adults need um, flexibility, they need access, they need affordability. 
Uh, WGU has held a constant price for its tuition for um, 10 years now, uh, about $6,000 a year. And the student can take as many courses as they're able to take um, in any given term. So the average time to degree for a bachelor's degree is about two and a half years, about a year and a half to a master's. Um, so it's possible you know, to get a bachelor's degree for $15,000, that sort of thing. Um, cost, scalability, because we function with information technology. Um, and uh, ubiquitous 24-7 access so that the college comes to the student rather than the student going to the college, which is critical for adult workers. So um, if, uh, if it's true that in the knowledge, knowledge economy we need um, all these uh, individuals skilled up to participate, a lot of them are incumbent workers who need to advance, right? So, so uh, um, uh, you know, a majority of our students um, are working adults. Um, specifically dying to, to, to solve that, that issue. Um, in the larger skills gap uh, uh, conversation, um, one last comment for me, and that's that there is a certain percentage of the economy that requires a bachelor's degree or more. There's an awful lot of the economy, 45% um, the last time I looked, that has sub-baccalaureate needs, and that's um, the community and technical colleges, the military experience, that uh, we can't forget that. And then finally, high school does need some kind of reform. Uh, from my opinion, um, uh, you know what, you know, three-year high school with a year's internship. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen to help individuals who do not wish to pursue higher education still have a piece of the American dream. Um, I, I think it's very, very critical to solve these issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, and by the way, I just happened to see your advertisement last night on the TV. So the old wise owl. So good job. <laughs> So, Meg, perfect lead way to, to Meg. Meg Ryan. Yes, thank you. Um, just making sure the mic is on, ready to go. I'm Meg Ryan. Uh, I'm the former director of the Center of Excellence for Global Trade and Supply Chain Management at Highland College. And uh, I've been working on a, a project called Make It in Washington. Uh, I'd like to give you just a little bit of uh, history to that and reiterate uh, a few things that uh, Christina and Rich both said. Uh, about the adult learners in the state of Washington, but uh, essentially within the context of, of um, working adults in rural manufacturing companies. So um, back in 2013, uh, the Department of Labor uh, awarded our state workforce um, coordinating board uh, a grant called Make It in America. There were 13 states that received this grant. Uh, Washington State was the only one that was uh, considered rural. All of the other ones uh, would have a, a focus that was more urban, where access to um, community colleges or universities was uh, a little bit uh, easier. Um, we have, what, 31 counties in the state of Washington. Um, at least 31 of those were designated as rural. And so what Christina was saying uh, was that we, we, have, uh, we don't have that evenness across the state. And uh, yet we also display a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of manufacturing companies that uh, provide goods and services that, that are akin to an urban environment. Uh, and yet they also uh, lack some, some uh, resources and access to those resources um, that, that urban um, environments uh, are, are able to achieve. So the focus of the um, Make It in Washington, and it was coined that uh, to give it some local, um, um, and resonate with, with the locals, um, was to provide uh, actually kind of a two-prong uh, approach. One was some business consulting as well as education and training. So uh, I guess my question today, uh, and I'll try and answer it, um, but I'll, I'll pose this question, how do three federal agencies, three state entities, and four institutions of higher education um, enlist uh, 155 students uh, for over um, a year to two years uh, to to get an education and, and bring that back to the manufacturing companies to increase capacity of those manufacturers. Um, 
the focus uh, in terms of the specific training had to do with supply chain uh, management and logistics. It was thought that if we could help these companies um, increase capacity and move those goods and services out of the rural areas that, that they would flourish. And what we found uh, as we uh, sort of pounded the pavement of the 71,000 square miles in the state of Washington was that some of them were really flourishing and others not. Um, and, and that they had some real concerns, the manufacturers themselves, uh, about uh, who, who they could hire. Uh, There's a, a, a shortage, and, and Perry, you were talking about 40,000 jobs needing to be filled. These manufacturers are concerned about um, replacing those uh, with up and coming retirements, and, and how can they, with, with limited resources, uh, nurture and, and uh, bring up uh, the workers in, in their companies. Uh, there were some other things that we also learned uh, from the manufacturers, um, many of them being family owned or small businesses, that um, they honestly felt that if they could train their incumbent workers, that there was a, a more likelihood that they would stay in the rural communities. And I have to say, personally, that the vitality of those communities blew me away. Uh, that the quality of life was immense. And we have manufacturers that they range from water jets to medical devices to um, public art. And, and it just, it, it's certainly agriculture, which is one of our largest industries, uh, was widely represented here. And, and we got a lot of feedback from, from the companies. Um, so the, the way we approached it was that we um, uh, came up with 1,500 a listing, an inventory of 1,500 manufacturing companies. And we sent out uh, an invitation and received 200 back. And uh, Impact Washington, one of our partners, would uh, invite them to do a, a, a kind of, a, we were doing an asset mapping and offered some uh, individualized uh, business consulting and also the education and training. And I have to say many of the manufacturers actually wanted uh, all of those services. Uh, and they, they perceived it as a way, again, to um, mentor uh, their, uh, their employees and, and to keep them. And what we found was that uh, in the initial grant, uh, our educational institution was Washington State University. And uh, they were offering a master's uh, in their um, engineering and technology management program. And um, I would say that probably 45% um, of the incumbent workers that enrolled uh, were aimed at that master's program. But lo and behold, we found out that not all incumbent workers are ready or eligible for, for master's work. And so that was uh, at that point where um, I got a call at the Center of Excellence to say, what, what could the community and technical colleges provide in terms of, of training? And as Christina said, uh, the online learning seems to be a modality that um, provides the access in rural communities. Um, and so I identified two colleges, one being Highline and the other Shoreline, that had all online uh, certificates and degree programs in supply chain management and logistics. Uh, the Shoreline program actually emphasizes the procurement function, the, the buying uh, position. And as we went out to the manufacturers, that buying function seemed to really resonate. They thought if they could learn more about, about that buying function, that that would really impact that supply chain. Um, and so we began uh, to build momentum and uh, slowly but surely there became an interest in uh, understanding um, exporting and um, international trade. So, and, and you know that, that in the state of Washington, one in uh, four jobs is related somehow uh, to international trade. We are probably one of the most trade dependent and, uh, states in the, in the country. Um, but it, it wouldn't make it in Washington. We weren't asking uh, incumbent workers to commit to a one-day workshop or even a month long. It, it was, as, as uh, Rich said, time. 
uh, was an issue. They face um, barriers that they're working full time, they have families, um, they, they want to stay where they're at. Uh, one example, though, uh, we, I, there was one student, his name was Justin, and he worked for uh, a company that manufactures uh, sporting goods equipment uh, down in the Vancouver area. And as we got to know Justin, uh, he had taken a job at this company in the warehouse because it was available. Uh, and he was place bound. But he basically, at the end of all of this, said, you know what, Meg, I discovered a career. I had no idea. I had no idea. And, and I actually, in terms of supply chain management and logistics, it, it used to be, in, in, in a previous life, referred to as distribution. It was in the distribution channel all the way, ultimately, to the retailer. It, that whole distribution piece has risen to be on an executive level, whether you talk to Amazon or Starbucks or, or anywhere, any company, a, a, a real critical trap uh, in the company. So Justin and one of his coworkers that was also involved in the program at Heinlein heard that that I was attending uh, the Washington Council on International Trade Conference that's held here every fall. They got up at three o'clock in the morning to drive here to Seattle so they could learn more about trade. And it, it, this is the kind of exuberance that they displayed. They just simply embraced that. Um, the other thing that we found was that not only do those incumbent workers raise their skills, and most of them either got a raise or they moved into a higher level management, um, but they made an impact right there in the, in, the, in the company, in the process. In other words, it, it sort of flood, kind of flooded out into the, the, the workspace and they had conversations. And um, so it was benefiting the, the entire company. We also listened to what we didn't have to offer believe it or not, we learned um, IT and a lot more about what the, especially the agricultural companies needed. So we've, uh, we've learned a lot from them and uh, by the end of, of this year, in December, uh, we will uh, have uh, all the completers. And so our goal was to have 144. Uh, and. Uh, that happened not only because we had something to offer and we could um, market it with a, a really concise, integrated uh, message, um, but I have to say that what we also learned was a process. We learned that it's critical to have a team that has access to, to the manufacturing companies. Um, you know, what do you do? Just go over to Yakima or Kuala Wala and knock on the door. How do you get in? How, 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 how do you get welcomed? And we had a lot of help from uh, economic development, uh, from uh, rotaries, numerous people that would introduce us. And it was really about building relationships. And as far as the schools were concerned, the kind of coordination that's needed uh, for example, so there's an incumbent worker that wants to take a course or a certificate program at either of the colleges, then what happens? Um, do you let them navigate that college website on their own and work their way through the registration process? Uh, well, we did not. We uh, uh, gave them oversight, handheld holding. Uh, we coded them so they wouldn't get an invoice or get dropped from a course for lack of payment because the tuition was going to be paid by the workforce board. If a class closed, we had professors that would add them. We could hold blocks of classes, but they were mainstreaming regular classes. And uh, one of the other barriers that I think incumbent workers that haven't been in college uh, recently or at all, uh, with their workload and their family, uh, they face, uh, I would say the, the, the workload is not always steady. And so to have professors who are willing to have flexible due dates for projects really, really helped. So you don't need to have a center of excellence in your state 
that you do need to have some sort of educational facilitator who knows the system. And I don't know about the other states, but many of our community colleges don't have the same processes. Um, I was working at Highline with continuing ed to, to do all the coding and registration. Shoreline doesn't have continuing ed, but they had uh, an online learning center. And so you have to find and uh, sit down and find the fiscal person who's going to be able to do the invoices and who's going to do the registration. And that's really the ground, on the ground, uh, nitty gritty stuff that uh, had to come after we did all the recruitment and all the art articulating with the companies. Um, so it's, it's been a really interesting project and out of that project grew another a one year pilot study with the USDA. And uh, one of the deliverables from my center was that we inventory all of the online classes, including hybrid, in all 34 community and technical colleges that would be of interest to the food industry. So if they want supply chain, fine. But if they want robotics or mechatronics or whatever it is, we know where to go. And so the concept here of make it in Washington can be expanded in terms of academic discipline or training. And it can certainly be broadened in terms of bringing in more of the community and technical colleges. So we, we have, I think, really got some incredible momentum with the Make It in Washington and USDA. And we're looking forward to continuing on with that project. And I'm really excited to, uh, to share that with you. If you have any, any questions, I'll, I'll look forward to um, your insights and questions about how you might engage in something like this. Thank well, you. Thank you, Meg. Wow. Okay, you all still there? Are you ready for your questions? All right, so Juan, take us to an employer and how you are addressing the skills, the skills gaps within Amazon. Sure, sure. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to meet you, and a special treat for me to meet Meg Ryan, who was so good to sleep with us in Seattle. So, <laughs> I am well rested. <laughs> um, I'm Juan Garcia. I'm a recovering Texas legislator, uh, naval aviator. As my kids like to say, a nasal radiator. I served in the Obama administration. <laughs> and uh, I'm with a little scrappy little startup uh, uh, here in town you might have heard of called Amazon. And I direct a program we call uh, Career Choice. Career Choice is our tuition assistance program. But we think it's a little uh, peculiar to use an Amazonian term. Lots of companies across America have, have increasingly generous tuition assistance program. I think if you scan and survey across, you find the bulk of them tend to be focused on the white collar management exempt workforce. Amazon doesn't have a tuition assistance program for our white collar force. It's exclusively, exclusively for our hourly workforce. Uh, a couple other things that, that make it uh, unusual. We front pay. You know, it's a, it's a realization uh, for adult workers with complicated lives, uh, having them reach in their pocket for a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars, even if they're confident for reimbursement, can be an inhibitor, uh, consciously or subconsciously. But the real special sauce of career choice, I'd like to say, is we do the homework in advance. And what I mean by that is in every uh, node, as we say, around the country and the world, because we do this in 10 countries, uh, we partner with the Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, to determine exactly what the most in-demand roles in that community, in that community, will be. And then we offer coursework exclusively in those fields of study. So it varies geographically. If you're from South Texas, where I'm from, it might be welded when the petrochemical industry is thriving, especially after the events of the last couple of months. In the Pacific Northwest, it might be aircraft mechanic certification, where Boeing and others, uh, as you know, have a significant need. But the point is, we are offering courses of study only in the most in-demand roles in your town, in your community. So there's no kind of uh, uh, exploring your intellectual curiosity. This is to arm you with the tools you need to leave Amazon, which is kind of peculiar, a little unusual. People say, wait, let me get my arms around this. You're training people and paying them pay 95% tuition, books, and costs. As soon as you're, you're eligible, as soon as you have one year under your belt, $3,000 a year to $12,000, we're paying people for the most in-demand roles. We're paying them to leave. It seems peculiar. Of course, the traditional model for a big uh, or near-peer manufacturer is to uh, invest in folks and hope to keep them for a career. And we hope we do. But this is an acknowledgment that much like uh, uh, Rich's father, the Carmen experience, um, 
if you believe what the demographers say, that those days when an individual spent 40, 50 years with a single company and graduate with the proverbial watch at the end, retire, um, well, it doesn't work like that very much. Yeah. This generation is much more likely to have six or eight stops across the course of their professional and personal journey. We want to acknowledge that and we want to help folks uh, ensure that their next stop is an upwardly mobile. Now, we think it's the right thing to do. We also think there's a business case. You know, we, we're getting a better, better recruit if they see this as a pathway to their next opportunity. Amazon's got a pretty sophisticated way of measuring engagement, and we can track that those folks who are taking advantage of the program are much more engaged than those who are not. And of course, their attrition levels, you might expect, is four times lower than folks who are not taking advantage of it. So um, how invested in this? How much of a believer are we in this? Well, um, uh, this may offer some evidence in, in that regard. Once uh, Amazonian completes a course of study, we actually give them a couple thousand dollars to leave. We call it the offer, an acknowledgement that, uh, hey, if I just got that nursing certification, I may need to buy new uniforms. Or I just got that CDL uh, license, there could be a gap between that first paycheck. How committed are we to this thing? In every new Amazon building, and as you know, it's spraying up all over the country and all over the world, and retrofitting in all buildings with greater than 1,000 associates, which is actually a more expensive way to do it, we built dedicated career choice classrooms. If you've ever been in one of these fulfillment centers, it's literally the first thing you see, just no accident. You come through the turnstiles, you check in, and the very first thing you see is these dedicated career choice classrooms, and we build them fishbowl style, glass walls. And the idea is that at a minimum, at a minimum, every associate who comes to work that day has to walk past that thing twice, on the way in, on the way out, and say, hey, Jones is taking advantage of this thing. How come I'm not doing the same? Now, uh, to this group of leaders, I, th I think the part that might be most beneficial is there's, without a doubt, a part of this is a, that's targeted at, uh, at young people wrestling with what to do after high school. Breakfast tables across America this morning, moms and dads had conversations with sons and daughters who, for whatever reason, college isn't the immediate offing, uh, resources or readiness, um, but they want to move out of mom and dad's house, and they're looking for an opportunity to get health care, and the top line in their resume, and the Amazon case stock, and sock away money for school. And for 75 years, those conversations have, have focused around things like the GI Bill, which maybe Rich father took advantage of, or, or my friend Navy SEAL Doug Munn's probably took advantage of. Uh, I think it's the best legislation that, that happened in the past century. But it's not for everyone. We think this is the GI Bill without the GI. So we think this is a, a draw and attraction for those, those young people who are recruiting moms and dads as well. But for this group, to me, the most compelling example is when we see adult learners who Life circumstances conspired against them after high school. Now it's been 5, 10, 15 years since they've been in a learning environment, since they've stepped in the classroom. And life's not complicated, right? Uh, they've got the proverbial golden handcuffs on of, of making rent and, and take care of kids. So what these classrooms do is allow folks to, uh, we schedule, bring in faculty from community colleges, from vocational training centers. We schedule classes before and after shifts. So the idea is you don't have to, uh, to walk outside your car. So instead of, of having, I think, a pretty unrealistic expectation that someone's going to finish their shift, go pick up a child at daycare, make soccer practice for another one, and make it across town to a community college and park, and make it on, on time for class, that's a pretty heavy lift. We bring the classes to them. Now, in some, in some fields of study, they can do the whole curriculum right there in the building. CDL, which is wildly popular, life-changing compensation. Um, we can do the classroom portion right at uh, the Amazon Classroom. Many times we can do the driving portion, the big Amazon parking lots. The whole thing is done in 10 weeks. It can change your life. For others, like the nursing certification or, uh, or um, computer-aided design or the IT fields, you might ultimately have to make your way to a lab on campus. But to allow folks to find is to allow folks to, uh, to step back into the learning environment among the comfort of their peers at their workplace with all the logistical hassle removed is, uh, is a great facilitator. And, uh, Without being too dramatic, the most compelling, we have 14,000 Amazonians across uh, 10 countries who take advantage of this program so far, um, is to see someone uh, take that huge psychological step across the chasm and say, the learning part of my life isn't over yet. This is not my terminal rank. Um, I've always had an aspiration or dream. I think this is the way I can get there while still paying the bills and making money. That's great. Sure. Okay. Well. I've got a load of questions, um, but I'm going to hold mine for you. All right, so questions for the panel in the audience. Yes, up here. Lauren's going to be running around the room here, it looks like, and I can help out too. 
Hi, uh, Bill Simons from the Global Pathways Institute, and I'd like to um, direct my uh, question to the employer on the panel, uh, Juan, and I wanted to set a broader context. I mean, Amazon is, I think, the fastest growing company in America, if not the world. I think you added over 100,000 employees in the past year. And I was wondering if you could give us the context of, and, and of course, uh, your uh, bidding for the second headquarters, I think. Is you heard about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we were surprised yesterday that Spokane was among those who applied, uh, in addition to the more than 250 other cities. But, um, and you're going to create 50,000 jobs with that. So looking at the, you know, the, all these jobs you have to fill, what are the skills gaps you see in terms of, um, you know, the jobs where you find um, uh, the biggest problems? And, and related to that, yesterday we spoke a lot about uh, the value of internships and apprenticeships. Microsoft, for example, hires, I think, over 3,000 uh, interns every summer. To what extent is Amazon using that strategy? Great. Thanks, thanks for the question, Bill. Um, uh, let's see. Um, but there will always be a uh, insatiable demand for SDE, software design engineers. Those uh, folks are around. We can't make enough of them, and we're not alone in that. Uh, but the reality for Amazon is, is the growth has been so exponential. And to give you a sense of how exponential it's been, I've been aboard, I left the Obama administration, I've been at work for two and a half years. I'm told I'm in that upper quartile, upper 25% of seniority, uh, that the growth is just that fast. Um, so to fill those, those buildings with often a couple thousand associates per building, we've gone to what we call lights out uh, hiring. There's actually no interview. It's a, it's a cultural assessment done online, a background check. And we put folks into training and let them uh, uh, have their crack at it. Um, so, uh, uh, to your point, we've always drawn a line at a, a, a traditional high school diploma or a, a equivalency degree. But once we get folks in the door, we think we can um, we can train them from there. So the skill level required for the overwhelming bulk of Amazon jobs is entry level. But a program like Career Choice then comes in, and we like to think. Uh, returns them to the community if they choose to do so with the most uh, in-demand certifications and degrees possible. Um, and the last piece I had is that we're so committed to this program that Jeff has charted, my, Jeff Bezos has charted my team to say, hey, take this across the country, take this across the world, and tell any company that's out there uh, with a significant hourly workforce that if they think this program could do for them what it does for Amazon, in some variation, that we want to share it with you. There is no cost, there is no charge, there is no hook. Here's our playbook, here's how we administer it, here's our labor market studies, here's our relationships with the schools. We think this is the future of the American workforce. And ultimately, ultimately, we get to a place where we build this ecosystem across the country where folks can come in, max out their engagement, three or four or five years, whatever works best for them and their family, leave with a new degree or certification to a new role that they're equally engaged in, we bring a new cadre behind them, then we build this thing out across America. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the question. It's a great question. I, I have a question that I just got to ask here. Um, I see maybe a representation from Association of Washington Business, Gary Chandler, back there, who really is focused on a lot of rural businesses and employers across the state. Uh, we've got another major employer, Walmart, here that's engaged in um, our first in the state of Washington, which is really focused on retail sector as an industry sector, and Walmart Foundation was so kind to invest in that at the Snohomish County to really build out that retail model, um, very similar to the Amazon Amazon model, um, Juan, but really focused on that front end, sales, store sales type of thing, um, as well as other lodging industry is, is part of that, I believe, right, Debbie? Um, and so, so I guess the compelling question is, how, you know, I, I, you know, I sit down to a workforce board perspective, um, I'm always challenged with this, okay? So I don't know if there's a real answer here, but there's so many people, we're all here, right? And we are listening and learning, right? And we see these opportunities to engage our adult learners as well as our youth. Um, and, but, but we're, they're not getting engaged, right? We can do it one employer at a time, but the challenge that I, sense and I feel a sense of urgency about and don't really have the answer and I'm opening it up to the panel here as well as to the audience. How do we reach the, 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 the fabric of our communities to educate them, to make them aware of these business of these career opportunities? So I don't think we're doing a good job then. 
no, we're not. I do. We have a significant opportunity in the state of Washington to do a better job at that. And it's really kind of more of a systematic approach. So, what what is your experience there, um, as uh, you know, those that are here up on the panel, um, maybe as educators, or maybe more so, because you might have more insight and research in the, in that particular topic. And I also turn it over to the audience in case you have the, the magical answer that I'm seeking to seeking to find. You want to want to take a first stab at that? Meg? Sure. Looks like you're sure, I'll take it. I was looking, I thought maybe Kristen was going to step up there. I, you know, from my experience uh, with the Make It in Washington uh, project, it, I'm going to go back to relationships. Uh, as we went out to the manufacturing companies, we sat down with them and, and really had to educate them on, on the opportunities. And, and I don't mean just the availability, but, but a, a deeper understanding of, of the whole process. Um, and I think we have to do a little bit of selling in terms of um, having them understand what's in it for them um, and how it's going to benefit them. Why should they take the time to do that? Um, and I, I have one quote I wanted to share from one of the participants. This is from one of the, the owners. Our business has been helped by a federal grant program called Make It in Washington. We gained important insight into the core values of our business, and specifically the area of operations and that needed attention in order to address various business risks. Being a small business, we did not have easy or affordable access to consulting services, nor did we recognize we needed it. And I would reiterate that also for the education and training. Um, they're on the ground working hard, keeping just the day-to-day -day operations going. And um, to contemplate an exporting plan or other things really needed some convincing. But it's through that building of the relationship and also tapping into um, folks in their territory that they really know and trust. And that give, gave us the credibility to, to even have a conversation with them. So it's, it's building that network. And, and, and what we're finding now is that um, the Center of Excellence drew in a lot of the uh, community colleges that have uh, programs in the food industry. And they're getting together. So there's, there's some things that are happening after that to help coordinate all of that. But we have a process. The only thing I think from that is exactly right, that, um, you know, outreach um, within the community is a huge part of it, and then also sort of shepherding people in that process. Um, but it's true that that's really hard to scale, um, because it's one on, it's basically one-on-one -on -one like coaching, counseling, <coughs> mentoring, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that part is hard. Um, but the other part of it is, uh, outside of outreach, is, um, you know, creating a new value proposition that actually does get at some of these barriers. Because people um, aren't just not going to college or uh, pursuing post-secondary education, you know, out of stupidity. It's because they don't have, you know, it's too expensive. It's too difficult to get to. They have childcare needs. They, um, they have career needs. So um, I think, uh, you know, this might, it might still be a Patrick approach that gets at each of those barriers, but um, that's why, uh, you know, something like what Amazon is doing is so useful because it does get at one of those barriers. And it's one of the things that WGU is doing um, gets at the affordability and the um, place found in this barrier. Um, so I think it's, it's both sides, the, the outreach and then also, you know, in, in a very concrete way, um, uh, addressing some of the barriers that are the, the main reasons that people aren't attending. Yeah, um, so, you know, there's a jewel in uh, 34 different communities around the state that cover all 39 counties, and it's called a community or technical college. And um, I think that uh, as the, as a, I'm a former community college president, I was president of Columbia Basin College in Pasco uh, in the Tri-Cities, and, you know, we were at our best um, and always at our best across the system when we are engaged with employers. When employers come to us and they say, this is what we need, can you help us 
do this. And, uh, um, and it requires a little investment time on the business side and investment time on our side, that sort of thing. But um, boy, I, you know, there are just tons and tons of those kinds of success, successes in terms of uh, workforce development. The, the larger issue of uh, the working adult who's time bound, place bound, um, whose uh, who's willpower is exhausted through all the day's uh, work by the time they get to a place where they can actually get to higher education in the evening or wherever. Um, those kinds of issues uh, need to be solved. And I think information technology is just at the forefront. Um, it's just at the beginning of, uh, of that kind of revolution. And I also believe that um, higher education, and this is heresy in higher education circles so probably to say this, it needs to be more like a commodity and less like a cruise ship. Um, it needs to, uh, to be affordable and uh, accessible and inexpensive, um, low cost uh, for, for, uh, for the majority of Americans. And there's ways to do that. Um, I think the WGU is, uh, is, is an institution that's piloting some of those ways. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big deal. Also, finally, um, a college like or a university like WGU, we're, we have four colleges, so we're focused on workforce development and nothing else, education, IT, business, and health. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to ask a more specific question this time. And, and, and I think it applies to any one of the panelists. Do you feel we are lacking the branding or the marketing of all the things that we have great in our, in our state and, and also in other states around the western, western coast. Is there an opportunity there? And, and, and if so, is anyone or any of you addressing that? I mean, I know you would benefit from it, right? Why? <laughs> but go ahead. Sorry. No. Well, I was, I was just going to to your question, I think it punctuates a point that Christina made. Uh, I think there's a sense that we've all acknowledged that I think the overall uh, majority of folks, it's not any lack of desire to upgrade their skills. But life's complicated, and it's hard to break away and, and still make the rent and uh, and meet all the obligations of being an adult with the family. Uh, and I, one thing I want to make clear was that uh, our experience as we've open source career choice, including you mentioned someone was from Walmart, uh, worked with their my counterpart with their dietary, and uh, they had their own version of this as well. Is that this model doesn't require being a, uh, a five hundred thousand person company. Some of my favorite doctors are uh, small mom and pop outfits. There's a little outfit down in San Diego, California. They call it, they do adventures. They surf tours. Teach people to surf. They call themselves uh, uh, Surf Me to the Moon. But they have a little call center uh, about as the size of the corner of this room. That's where people call in and make their plans and schedule their vacations. And the young the young guy who owns this thing realized, hey, I get a better recruit if I can offer them. They do career choice style, they bring faculty in right in that call center. Said, I get a better recruit if I tell people I'm going to pay for their school. Uh, they're more engaged, they're more fired up to come to work, and they don't quit on me if they're working their way towards a degree of certification. In Amazon's case, for a program that's in many ways become the face of the Amazon associate experience, you know, the, the, the ground truth is that we do it for 1.6% of our overall employee benefits spend. It's the best one we're spending. Um, so I, I, all that to make the point that this does not have to be a big, huge, near peer manufacturer. We need this model or a variation of it. We look for businesses all over the city. That's great. Thank you for that statistic, by the way. Sure. Questions from the audience? Any, any uh, thoughts on the questions I pose? Yes, Bill. Uh, so I had, a, I had a question for you, but I, I also I wanted to address the broader point you raised of how do we address this. We talked about this yesterday in the first panel that we need to make career development a fundamental uh, cornerstone of our education system. What that means is that talking to every student about what the economic opportunities are. We heard this morning, um, you know, the, the speaker was talking about the American dream has died. People don't see economic opportunity. We need to expose all kids to uh, what the economic opportunities are and help them decide what a good career path uh, would be uh, for them. And I think states can help take that, uh, promote that by requiring every student to to develop a career plan before they leave high school. Not to say they aren't going to change their mind, but at least they've got some vision for what they're going to do with it. And so I think that's a, that's a fundamental thing. From the view of the Washington Workforce Board, what I'm going to ask you about is we've heard a lot here at this conference about STEM and IT for obvious reasons. But if you look at the reality of the Washington Workforce, a lot of people are in the retail industry. 
Uh, a lot of people are in the hospitality industry. Uh, I'm not sure exa exactly what percentage of Washington workforce is, but it's a huge percent. What are you doing uh, uh, about those sectors? Uh, what's your strategy there? That's unfair. You're not supposed to be asking the moderator the question. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, there is uh, a significant amount of effort going on right now. And I see Nova Gatman back there with the workforce uh, staff of the workforce board as well. And, and, and I believe most of the panels up here has had experience with the workforce board, so please, please uh, contribute to what I'm getting ready to say. Um, there's, there's a couple of things. One is, um, more specifically, is the the, from the National Governors Association, the Career Connected Learning uh, Initiative. We're in the year two now where we've stood up a, a task force that is Career Connect Washington is what it's, it's, it's uh, known as or it's branded as it, that I co-chair with Brad Smith, the president of, of Microsoft. And that is heavily focused on that youth engagement um, in our K-12 system. Uh, Chris Wright, Raydahl, um, our superintendent of public instruction, is involved in that as well as many of the agencies and other businesses across the state um, that are contributing to that. Um, but that that really is focusing on that youth, the youth engagement and trying to change the optics, that social fabric of our of our communities to accept, um, uh, you know, moving into like a youth apprenticeship program or into an internship into a skills based industry. Such as you know, that can be hired by our small businesses and our medium-sized businesses, as well as our large employers across the state. But it's really skills-oriented and trying to create, you know, um, change the optics, the family optics that you have to be programmed to go to. You're programmed to go to college, and if you don't go to college, you're a failure. Which is you know, in our family environments, that's not uncommon, and and so because that's what we've been told. And and so we're trying to change that social fabric, that social uh, perspective. Um, with a lot of the, you know, engaging our youth that want to learn differently than going to college, um, but they need or they desire to be learning while doing, right? Um, um, it's a, 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 and so that's that's one initiative. It's a big part of our our talent prosperity for all state plan. That's our, our from the uh, I think all of you understand the WIOA and our state planning process that we all have encountered. Um, but that's an integral part of, of our state plan is that career connected learning initiative. Um, and really focused also on the barrier communities, you know, the populations, the disadvantaged populations, um, um, the populations with disabilities, you know, the deaf and the blind and, and uh, other populations, the, and, you know, the uh, military, <coughs> um, military folks. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a wide swath of different um, uh, populations that we're focusing on on that as well, both as a youth and an adult learner. Um, part of the initiative being that uh, IT is an industry sector, and we, we are focused really on uh, the industry sectors uh, that, that are been defined by the Department of Commerce. IT is one of those, agriculture um, is another, uh, hospitality and lodging, which is the retail initiative that we're doing right now up in Snohomish County to really expand that. Because retail does exist. Our services industry, retail and lodging, exists in every community in our state. And I suspect the same is true with all of you, right? They're in the different states. And so, so um, but it's one of, it's the only industry sector that we've never done a, a kind of a round table uh, industry engaged thinking around how can we make retail and the lodging industry, hospitality industry, sexy, right? And attractive. What are those career paths? Because typically they're perceived as low wage, low wage entry level jobs, right? I want to do part time or something. It's not a career kind of, of, of uh, uh, dynamic there. And so, but, but there are careers in retail. There are careers in the hospitality industry. And, and so we need, we need, we're spending time on figuring that out and trying to, again, everything that we're doing at the, at the state level is systematic, right? Right now we've got islands of great success, right? We've got little pockets across the state that have been needs-based because industry said, I got, I need this worker, right? And a lot of that is in the rural communities across the state. Um, the maritime industry is a great, a great example of that. The aerospace industry with Boeing is another great example of that where, where major employers said, you shall do this or else I'm gone. And, and, but it's not, you know, as soon as that need dissipates, 
or that champion that was running that program retires or goes on to other, other uh, interests, um, that program just kind of starts fizzling down, right? Because we haven't built it as a system, as a part of our, our, our fabric of our, our system, right? And the funding streams start failing. And, and, and then pretty soon you've got institutions like the Moss Maritime Academy down in Tacoma that has a great brand but no, no curriculum. That's been heavily funded by Moss Maritime, but, but there's no educators to, to train the people that they need for their industry. Because that, that, that crusader, the, the lead person that took on that initiative, went and took another job someplace else, and the program fell apart. So, so we have to look at this on a system, system level basis, and that's what the Workforce Board is doing. So I don't know if that's, I think that's kind of really targeted. You know, it's, there's a lot more content there that I'm sure will bore everybody to death, but it's available on the Workforce Board's uh, website, and, and, and all the meetings are public, and, and we welcome your involvement in that. Question? Thank you. Um, I like that you brought up a system approach, system analysis. So my question is, you know, what is the understanding of the panel from all these different programs, these training programs of what available known research, and I've read through the, the research that the Workforce Board has put out, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but overall, systematically, what's our understanding of the balance that would optimize Washington State's industry skills needs to keep our industries competitive across the state and the employment needs of the communities between the different post-secondary options, um, like four-year university, two-year skills, technical career, technical colleges, and then apprenticeships? That's a good question. Um, and, and I don't know that I am going to answer it, actually. I'm so sorry about that. But um, I will say that um, from our office's point of view, the reason that we are focusing on bachelor's degrees is because there is so much um, career-connected learning and apprenticeship uh, support programs. Um, so I don't know what the, I mean, I, I would leave it to the workforce board experts to, um, to answer that question as to what's the right, what's the, the best balance between, um, you know, bachelor's, master's, um, apprenticeship programs that would make for a long-term um, healthy economy. Um, but I, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, our approach is is within this uh, context of all these other programs. Um, so that's where we're coming from. Yeah, I, I, I think I feel a little bit akin to uh, Christina. It's, uh, it can be a bit overwhelming looking at it. Uh, there are so many choices, so many avenues, um, that when I think about what a junior or senior in high school is going through to decide it's not just a question of college or not college or you know um, vocational or whatever there there's um, a, a lot going on uh, in education that that also um, reflects I think what's needed out in the industry you find folks coming to community colleges that already have four-year degrees that are what I would call swirling down, uh, maybe someone with a four-year marketing degree comes into a community college to get a two-year uh, certificate in graphics so that they can go to work for a communication uh, uh, company. Uh, so there are lot, lots of, of things <coughs> out there, um, but, but I think my response is, is incremental steps uh, building on the success of what we have done in the past and uh, making sure that it doesn't get dropped as we change hands in terms of uh, people leaving and that mobility within within our our group that, that takes on the leadership. Uh, this is one of the reasons why building upon the Make It in Washington and the USDA pilot seems to make sense. We already have a critical mass of folks that we've educated. Um, but I, I also want to say that I come from a background of marketing and advertising um, as, as a faculty member. And uh, as I look at the community and technical colleges, and I, I maybe would have extended to the universities, that a lot of our promotional materials seem really institutional. Um, and, and I'm yet envisioning right now, if I could show you um, how 
the incumbent workers are taking a class from Washington State University, and their professor is, is on camera remotely in his backyard with his kids running behind him, right? And, and the incumbent worker is saying, oh, my kids are behind me too, so to speak. I'm, you know, I'm at my computer at home. There's a relevancy not only of curriculum, but a relevancy to lifestyle. And I, I heard that from Juan in terms of, of how he's um, talking about the Amazon model, walking past that glass bowl, of seeing that that's part of the culture. And, and I think we need to really start to, to focus on that um, a, a lot more. This is one company talking, obviously, but uh, I'll just share. We, we set a minimum threshold. We want 10% of our folks who have taken advantage of these uh, degree programs at any one time. Questions in the very back there. And uh, just do it, being cognizant of your schedule here. We've got about three minutes left. It's actually just a, a comment in response to the last question. Uh, Randy's following the Student Achievement Council, and we have, uh, for a little over a decade, collaborated with Workforce Board and State Board for Community Colleges on a skills gap analysis. Consistently, we find gaps at all levels, uh, mid-level being um, apprenticeship certificate and associate degree, bachelor's and graduate level. And um, so we need it all, unfortunately, is the answer. I would say, though, with that, that it's easier to import people with a bachelor's or master's degree than at mid-level. So we don't see as many people moving in with mid-level credentials. Yes, we're here in front. We're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just I have a comment too that kind of piggybacks on what um, the previous commenter said. Um, currently in Washington, just in spring quarter, this last spring quarter alone, there were twelve, approximately twelve thousand registered apprentices who were engaged in community and technical college classes. And something that in our um, current system, a lot of times the community college or technical college system sees apprenticeship as competing. And I don't see um, them needing to be exclusive, right? You either do apprenticeship, you're never gonna have access to a college degree, or you do college, right? If those classes had appreciable college credit attached to them, which actually a lot of, um, in fact, Columbia Basin um, worked with the Aerospace Joint Apprenticeship Committee to have college credit attached to those classes so that when those students, yes, students and apprentices, finish their apprenticeship classes or sometimes in the summer, they're still engaged with that college doing the general ed requirements towards an associate's degree. Now, this is what I know from many different apprenticeship programs. Apprentices often want to grow in their companies, which means that having a bachelor's degree, having at least an associate's degree, having a bachelor's degree offers them so much more mobility within that company or in that industry. So attaching college credit, I think, is a huge, huge benefit, right? There's rigor in those classes. It's the theory behind what they're doing on the job. It makes a huge difference for those people. The last piece, um, actually, no, I want to know if there's any, if you have any comments or thoughts about that. So do you, do you have a, a question or you just want us to comment on apprenticeships and, and that link to? That link, given that there are 12,000 people who are engaged in right. the community college system. Well, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea, and uh, the concept is um, being embraced by um, all of the center directors. Um, I, I don't know if you're all aware that we have 10 centers of excellence, and they're based on a, a sector strategy, so we have a center for aerospace and agriculture, and we're, we're all putting our heads together in terms of, of working on apprenticeships and linking it, just as you said. So I think, you know, if you were to look at the growth, the growth curve in terms of, of coming around alongside your concept, uh, it's, it's fairly early in, in the stages, but it is being addressed. Uh, and I think that, that each of the sector center directors are looking at, at linking that with, within their sectors. And um, we have someone at the state board uh, who, who's really 
a champion of that. Uh, so um, I think he's opening the minds of, of all of us in terms of breaking out of the traditional concept of the apprenticeship. So I think there's going to be some movement if I could be an encourager to him. I would concur with that. It definitely is some movement. Uh, uh, looking back at NOVA here, who's our uh, state board, um, legislative affairs uh, crusader, and, and that is part of our policy um, agenda, part of the, the work product from the Career Connect Washington task force is to make a, a recommendate, policy recommendations to the governor for this next legislative session, um, and, and the, the concept of dual credits so that the student doesn't feel penalized, nor is the school um, being penalized from a funding standpoint because the kid is going to the community college versus going to the high school to get their degree, um, is, is a big part of our legislative uh, policy recommendations. So, so it is happening in a meaningful um, way. We just have to, I think that's the role of all of you and your state organizations, um, is to be an advocate for that kind of, of continuing education and, and, and recognition um, and not be punitive just because you're choosing a certain path. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now. I'm getting flagged in the back of the room. It is 1045, if I'm not mistaken. 1047, actually. I'm um, sorry for keeping you two minutes late. Sorry, Mark. You told me to keep it on time. Um, but, uh, but thank you all. I um, appreciate the engagement here. Um, I'm sure the conversations are just now starting. Um, and uh, I'll be around for a few minutes, but um, panel, are you going to be around? What's your schedule? So yeah, it looks like many of the panel members are going to be around, so please engage with us. Uh, and thank you for your participation. Have a good evening.